Good morning. I had to make sure he was all put together back there, you know. Happy Father's Day. How many fathers do we have here today? All of them. If you're online and you're a father, let us know. Pop us a message and let us know that you're celebrating Father's Day with us. You know, the best Father's Day that I, gift that I can give you today is to help you to know Jesus more in your heart so you can be more like Jesus. So then you can go home and treat your children and your wives and your family like Jesus would. Right? What a better gift. So I could have came in with all kinds of gifts and said, Happy Father's Day, but the best gift that we can give you today is to help you to draw closer to the Lord. Amen? Amen. So if you're willing and able, let's stand. Hallelujah. Lord God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for a day to honor our fathers. Lord, you are our father. You are the ultimate father. And so God, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for every blessing, every gift that you've bestowed upon us. You gave your only begotten son for us, Lord, so that we don't have to live under the bondage of sin and death any longer, that we can live under freedom, that we have the assurance that one day we will be with you in glory. So God, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you for what you're going to do in our lives. Lord, I just pray that each one here, each one participating online, Lord, that we just set aside the cares of the world and we focus on you. We worship you with our full heart. We give you the glory and honor that you deserve in Jesus' name. Amen.
we praise you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for you are good and your mercy endures forever. Be glorified, be lifted high. Let the glory Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Sing that again. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Let the praises of 
with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus, Savior, for 
by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus created unto God unto the good works which he has prepared beforehand for us to walk in them Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Take courage, my heart. Stay steadfast, my soul. He's in the waiting. He's in the waiting. Hold on to your hope as your triumph unfolds. He's never failing. He's never failing. Take courage. Take courage, my heart. Stay steadfast, my soul. He's in the waiting. He's in the waiting. surely keep your promise to me that I will rise in your victory.
Thank you, Jesus. How many of us need to slow down, take time, breathe in, right? And then he'll reveal what's to come. And then it says, sing praise, my soul, find strength and joy. Let his words lead you on. So you have to be in the word of God to know what his words say, right? To lead you. Do not forget his great faithfulness. He'll finish all he's begun. So God, we just thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you that we can slow down, that we can take time and breathe in. Lord, that your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Lord, that we can sing praise in our soul and you'll, you'll provide strength, you'll provide joy. Lord, I thank you that your word does lead us on. Lord, when we don't know what to do in a situation in life, we can go to your word and your word does lead us. Hallelujah. So we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are faithful. As we talked on Wednesday night, Lord, you keep every promise that you have made. Every promise that you have made. And you will finish what you've begun. So God, we love you. We thank you. We just give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Let me just look at all your beautiful faces for a minute. Hi, Hannah. Hannah's back there waving like, look at me, look at me. <laughs> Hi, Jack. Alex, good to see you too. Hallelujah, God is good, amen? So happy Father's Day. So those of you who've been around for a few years know that on Father's Day I chew out all the fathers. And I send you away with a lot to do. But I'm going to have a different approach this year. I'm going to talk about our Father. Amen? As I said earlier, if we get to know our Father better and follow His ways, then we can become good fathers. So dads, you're off the hook today. I'm not going to chew you out. <laughs> but I want to start with a story. A small boy, he had been consistently late for dinner. There was dinner time. And he was always supposed to be at the table, and he was always late. And so one particular day, his parents warned him um, that to be on time, or there was finally going to be some consequences. We're not letting you come to dinner late anymore. And, and he found that he, he came to the table that night later than ever. And so he found that he, his parents were already seated at the table, already eating. And then he sat down at his place, and there before him was a slice of bread and a glass of water. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and so there was silence because he didn't quite know how to handle that, you know. And, but all of a sudden his father's hand reached over and took that plate and sat it in front of himself. And he took his plate full of food and sat it in front of the boy. And his dad then proceeded to eat nothing but bread and water. And so some may argue that the boy needed to experience that consequence of his disobedience. But here was the result. When the boy became a man, he said, all my life, I've known what God is like by what my father did that night. So that story just shows us an example of how our earthly father can help, or earthly fathers can hinder, our understanding of our heavenly father. So that father was a great example that he took the punishment for his son, right? Because he was late for dinner, and he ate bread and water, and his son ate a meal, but before we look at God as our Father today, I want, I want to just help you understand a little bit of culture in Jesus' day. Because culture then is different than culture is now, right? You would all agree? And it's different than culture was in Moses' day. 
And so in Jesus' day, so when Jesus had, was doing ministry, most people believed that God was very distant and God was very unknowable, right? And so one of, um, among the Greeks, there were two dominant beliefs uh, concerning the God. So they believed in more than one God, as you know. And one was held by those known as Stoics. They were called Stoics. And they believed that the gods did not have the ability to feel any emotion. So they were emotionless gods. And that comes from the idea that if God could feel emotion, then God could be hurt. And surely gods don't want to be, he can't hurt our gods, right? So they must be emotionless, apathetic, and indifferent. The second dominant belief concerning the gods at the time was held by a group known as the Epicureans, and they believed that gods were most characterized by perfect peace and tranquility. And so the Epicureans believed that the world was chaotic, it was out of control. I think we could all agree with that, right? The world's chaotic and out of control right now. And the gods would surely lose their tranquility and peace if they got involved in human affairs. And so surely the gods must be distant, detached, and uninvolved. So even the Jews, even the Jews, so that's the Greeks in Jesus' day, but even the Jews in Jesus' day had grown to believe that God was very distant, that he wasn't near them. And he was indifferent and he was to be feared. And the intimacy with God was a foreign concept. So what we felt in worship this morning in that intimacy of God, that was a foreign concept in that time. In the Jewish tradition, as you know, the people felt that the name of God, Yahweh, was so sacred and holy that a person had no right to even speak it out loud, right? And so their perspective of this distant, almighty God seemed to focus more on God who created the world, judged the world with a flood, parted the Red Sea, brought on the Red Plague, so all these powerful things that God had done, and how powerful and how just, just he was, but they also had this sense that he was not approachable, okay? So, you know, it kind of reminds me if you've ever walked into a great cathedral. Some of you, you know, like a, I've walked into the cathedral in, in many, or St. Paul, the big Catholic cathedral there, and you start to look at the towering ceilings and the pillars and the massive columns and the ornate st uh, statues and the stained glass windows, and visually it really kind of speaks the awesomeness of our God but it doesn't really speak to us about God our Father, right, who draws us near. It feels like God is distant, right? And so it's in this cultural context that Jesus recited the Lord's Prayer. We know the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew 6, Jesus was asked by his disciples to teach them how to pray. And in verse 9 of Matthew 6, Jesus begins with these words. He says, In this manner, therefore pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So Jesus could have started that prayer many ways, right? He could have said, the Lord Almighty, who is righteous and holy and has done great miracles, right? No, but he says, our Father, hallowed be thy name. He chose the term Father. Father, the all-sufficient provider of our needs, the author of our existence, the authority over our lives, the protector, the one who finds joy in us. God finds joy in us. Isn't that good that God finds joy in us? He's not looking down and going, man, you guys are a bunch of miserable, sad people. No, he finds joy in us. He may think sometimes we're miserable and sad, but for the most part, he finds joy in us. And he loves us unconditionally. It doesn't matter what you did this morning. It doesn't matter what you did last night. It doesn't matter what you did a week ago. God loves you unconditionally. And so our Father in heaven, think about that, who sits on the throne who reigns and resides, and he's eternal, and he's everlasting. He's all-knowing, he's all-seeing, he's sovereign. He's in a timeless place right now, right? Our Father in heaven. And then Jesus said, hallowed be your name. Hallowed means holy or consecrated, sacred, unblemished, sanctified, pure, and completely trustworthy. Hallowed is his name, which in scripture means hallowed is his character. So not just his name, but his character is hallowed. So this is a Father God who we read about in Zephaniah. Katie, that's where I was messing up the other day. I wrote down Zechariah instead of Zephaniah. I was telling her I wrote down Zechariah 3.17, and there is no Zechariah 3.17. And I couldn't find the verse I was looking for. What well, was Zephaniah 3.17? It says, the Lord your God, I know that was a tangent, but I wanted you to understand, Katie. The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. 
he will rejoice over you with singing. Isn't that beautiful of who God is? So he is our father who draws near to us, but he's not just any father, right? He's not just any father. The heavenly father is eternal. He's forever. He's sovereign. He's the creator. He's a Lord over all things. Because of his holiness and our sinfulness, we have no right to enter his presence, do we? But yet, through Jesus Christ, we can. We, he calls us to, in Hebrews 4.16, to let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Which means we can come into his presence. We should come into his presence. We need to come into his presence with confidence and receive grace and mercy at any time in our need, right? The psalmist writes in Psalm 8, 3, and 4, When I consider your heavens, talking about God's heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? How is it that a God so big that created all these things would invite us to draw near? Think about that. But the truth is, um, our Heavenly Father um, it, it, we can draw near to him because of Jesus Christ, right? Mark 14, 36, we even hear Jesus refer to God as Abba, Father, right? And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me, nevertheless, not I will, but your will be done. So this would be equivalent of calling God Daddy or Papa. That's what the word Abba means, Daddy or Papa, right? And that type of intimacy with God would have been unheard of in Jesus' day. Because they felt God was distant. So to call God Papa or, or, or Daddy probably would have been unheard of. Um, but Jesus knew the reality of who God was. And, and he calls us to pray to our Father who we also can know that intimately. We can know him just like our Papa or our Daddy, right? So Luke, if we go to Luke 11, or 15, I want to talk a little bit about the prodigal son. Because there's a great example of, of Jesus being... Uh, telling us a parable about the Father. So we're going to go to Luke 15, and it shows us the love of the Father. And so to better understand this story, again, I want to bring you back to the situation, the culture that Jesus was in when he told the story. And so the Bible tells us that Jesus was speaking to a group of people, right? It wasn't one or two people, but a group of people that were known publicly. They were known also as bad people and sinful people. And they were the type of people who would have agreed that their lives probably weren't going so well. And at the same time, standing nearby, there was a group of Pharisees, right? The religious leaders. And the Pharisees were powerful, but they were kind of arrogant, right? They knew everything. And we read in Luke 15, verses 1 and 2, Then all the tax collectors, so that would be your Pharisees, and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. So the, the tax collectors, the sinners drew near to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribe complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So we know that the Pharisees were always kind of um, picking at Jesus because he dealt with sinners, right? So here we have Jesus, the Son of God, sitting with and teaching people who were considered probably the worst sinners of the day, right? And standing not far away from the worst sinners of the day, were the arrogant, super spiritual leaders. Is that even, it's an oxymoron, right? The arrogant, super spiritual religious leaders who had a spirit of religion and not a relationship with God. And they were listening and they were judging every word that Jesus said. So this is a situation that Jesus was in when he tells this story of the prodigal son. So he tells of a man with two sons. I'm going to kind of paraphrase it and we're going to read bits and pieces, but I'm not going to read the whole story. So you know the story, most of you do. The younger son comes to his father. He says, I want my inheritance now, right? I'm not going to wait till you die. I want it today. And in that time, inheritance was never given until, to a son until the father died. So once the father died, the son could collect his inheritance. So in the culture of that day, it was the same as telling your father, I wish you were dead because I want your money, right? I'm telling you, I wish you were dead because I want my money. So instead of slapping the son around, instead of taking him out and publicly whipping him, right, uh, to save the father and the family's honor, um, which would have been a normal response to that kind of a request, the father grants the request and gives him the money. And so thinking of Jesus' listeners at the time, 
the father's actions would have been unthinkable. It's just not something you would do. It's just not something right. If the son came to the wealthy father and said, give me my inheritance, he would have said no. He would have probably smacked him around a little bit, right? So it would have been unthinkable. And in the Middle East culture at that time, shame and honor were key, right? And so one would avoid shame at all costs. And the story was, story was so extreme that the listeners are probably thinking that this story would never happen in real life. It would never happen. And so Jesus was describing kind of this unthinkable, shameful action that the people would begin to grasp and the unimaginable love of the Father. Let's jump to verse 13 through 16. And so not many days after the younger son, so this is after he, uh, he, he had gotten his money, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. So the son, in a matter of months, I don't know how long it was, right? he spent all this money that he got from his father. He had taken generations of money, money that was saved probably generation after generation and accumulated over time. And how foolish he was that, that he would spend this money, and, and it was such a disgrace, and it only got worse. And so for a Jewish person at that time, pigs were considered unclean animals, right? And so they, they would have been horrified, and this would have been horrifying to Jesus' listeners, that the son would fall to the point of desperation that he would even consider working with pigs, right? So finally, we know the son comes to his senses, and he makes a plan that he's going to return to his father and beg to be made a servant again, not a son. But even with that plan, he's not being very realistic, he had already taken and wasted his inheritance. He wasted more money than he probably could ever repay. So up until this point, the son had been living off from his father's money, and now he was vowing to become a servant, go home, and pay it back himself. Thinking he could go back as a servant and make things right would be the same as thinking that you could pay back a billion-dollar debt today with a minimum wage job. That'd be kind of like daunting, wouldn't it? And so this kind of thinking doesn't even make sense, does it? A hired worker, even at that time, was the poorest of the poor. They, a lot of them were the ones who would gather together and they would stand in the city square each morning hoping that someone would come by and hire them for the day to do some odd job. And so it's a good thing that, that the son realized that, that he also sinned against God and his father, right? He recognized that. But the belief that he could somehow make it right on his own efforts showed that he doesn't understand the size of his wrongdoing and the hopelessness of his efforts to make it right. And so nevertheless, the son starts journeying home. And because of the shame that he had brought his family and the failure that he experienced financially, he probably was expecting to be ridiculed. He was probably expecting to be ostracized. He was probably expecting to be rejected by the community once he returned. And that was part of, the, of a, the cultural punishment at that time that was received by people with grave misbehavior. But the father, we know, had different plans. So Jesus described it with these words in Luke 15, 20. And he arose and he come, came to his father, but he, when, when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. So Jesus, again, hits his audience with this surprise. When he was still afar off, his father saw him. So I'm sure that this is startling to the people that are around Jesus at the time for a number of reasons. The first reason that they're probably startled is that the father sees the son while he's afar off. So think about this for a moment. This may not be startling to you and I because we live in Wisconsin. And if you're out on a farm, you can look out your window and you can see miles down the road, right? And, and you can see if someone was coming. But people at that time... Even if they had land and they were farming, they still lived in a village and they lived in a walled village. And, and so the, they lived in a village inside walls. And so for the father to see that his son was coming when he was a long way off means that he would have to step out of his house, walk through the town, go to the city gates and look. Right? And look. And I'm sure, I don't know how many times, the father got up, 
walked out of his house, walked down the city streets, walked to the gates, and expecting to see his son. Nope, not today. Goes back home. He gets up, walks the streets to the city gates, looks for his son. How many times did the father go to those gates? How many times did he go out and look across the ground, wondering if today is the day that I have the joy of seeing my son come back home? We don't know, right? We don't know. But we know he was expecting him. He was expecting him to return. And we do know that he saw him when he was afar off. The next surprise comes when the, with the, fa the fact that the father has compassion on him. So this is unexpected. So if a father is going to be waiting at the gate for his son, um, it's probably going to be, he's probably going to say, you know what, I'm standing here so you can't come back. You, you took the money, you wasted it, I'm coming to the gate to tell you to leave, right? And to say, before you come into town, you've got to straighten your life out, kid. Enough's enough. Right? Just feeling sorry that you wasted everything is not enough. You've got to pull your life together. But again, the father surprises us because he has compassion. So then comes perhaps one of the biggest surprises in the whole story. It says, while he's still a far way off, the father sees him. He's filled with compassion, and it says he ran to him. The father ran to him. So, so again, I want you to think about this. Running for an older, middle-aged middle-aged, Middle Eastern, dignified person was just not done, right? You just didn't run through the streets, right? There are things like in our culture today that we just don't do, and there are things in that culture that you don't do. And this was the sort of thing that a dignified person is not going to do. You know, you've got this nice robe on, you have to hike it up and show everybody your legs, and you've got to run down the road, right? You have status in the community, and so your robe is probably nicer than many, some other people, because you're wealthy, and you're not, you're supposed to walk with dignity, right? And as you get older, you may get a little swagger like Ted's got, and that's all good, but, but to pick up your robe and show your legs and run like a child to meet your son is humiliating. That would be humiliating in that time. It's just not done. And so this was so serious an issue culturally that the very, if, you, if we go back and we look at the earliest translations of scripture in the Arabic and the Syrian translations of the Greek, years, hundreds of years ago, the various earliest translations changed the word ran to his son, which is clearly what the word is in Greek, to um, he went to his son. Because it was embarrassing to say that this, this, uh, this Jewish man ran, right, to his son. So they actually changed the Greek word meaning to he went. But actually, it's he ran to his son. So they couldn't imagine that Jesus would ever tell a story where a hero, where a God figure, would do something so humiliating. Think about it. So the father runs out to his son, openly humiliated, right? Love, love. No matter what the cost to his father and his dignity, he's going to run to his son because he loves him, no matter what he's done. So he gets to the son and he surprises us yet again because he wraps his arms around him and he kisses him. And so by the standard of this culture, the son should have had the privilege of kissing his father's feet. So when the father got to him, the son should have bowed down, kissed his father's feet, looking for forgiveness. But here in the story, we see he's wrapping his arms around his son, kissing him, right? But here, the, and, 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 and that's another costly demonstration of how the Father is rebuilding that relationship immediately on the spot, right? Like our Heavenly Father does. We'll, we'll, we'll relate this to our Heavenly Father in a little bit. And it's important to notice where it comes in the parable. It comes one verse before the Son makes his confession. So the Son hasn't even said, I'm sorry. The Son hasn't even asked to become a servant. The Son hasn't even said, I messed up, right? And the Father runs out to him, hugs him, and kisses him. The son hasn't said, I'm not worthy to be part of the family. He hasn't even said a word yet. Right? And the father goes out, puts his arm around him, and kisses him. This is what it means. This is what Jesus is telling us. Paul says it in different words in Romans 5.8. And it says, God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So Christ didn't wait to die for us until we went, you know what, we're sinners. We're wrong. We're we need to repent. And then die? No, he died for us while we were still sinners. So God took the first step of reconciliation in our lives, didn't he? He died for us. We weren't even thought of yet 
outside of God's mind. But he, he died for us while we were still sinners. Then we read in verses 22 to 24 in Luke 15, But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. So again, the son still has not had a chance to present the idea of becoming a servant, right? The father immediately gave him his son's status back by giving him the best robe, the shoes, the sandals, and the family ring that gives him the full authority as a son again. So the father even prepared this huge celebration for his son who had returned. This is how the father, the heavenly father, feels about sinful people who come home. He's ready to put on the best robe. He's ready to put on the sandals. He's ready to put on shoes. He's ready to give us the family ring and say, welcome home. So this, this first part of the story, up until this point, remember there was two groups of people listening. There was the sinners, and there was the Pharisees or the arrogant religious leaders. This, this first part of the story was probably and primarily given for those sinful people that Jesus was sitting with and teaching. And it was to offer and to show uh, the huge mercy and grace that, that he had for them and that our Heavenly Father has for them. But Jesus is not finished yet. He still has this other group of people to deal with, the, these religious, arrogant leaders. And so the story was being overheard by the arrogant, spiritual, religious leaders who were standing in a distance. And for, me, for them, Jesus is continuing the story. So let's read verses 25 to 32 in Luke 15. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a goat that I may, might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. So Jesus told of the older brother who never left home, right? He was very faithful and loyal to his father. He told how the older brother heard of the celebration, and as he came in from working from the fields, he asked the reason for the celebration. And, and when he found out it was for his rebellious brother, who is now returned home, he got mad, right? He got angry, he got furious. And so the older brother refused to join in on the celebration. The father came out to talk with him. And the older son yelled at his father, reminding him about how good he was. I'm a good son. I've been here. I've never transgressed you. And how I, you've never thrown a party like this for me. And so there was no love in his heart, in the son's heart. For his brother or for his father, he was only thinking about himself. And so in addition... When he talks about his brother, he doesn't talk about him as his brother. He says, that son of yours, your son, right? And now all of you who have families know what it's like when, when your wife goes, your son did this, or your daughter did this, right? Because she's not claiming to own them at that point. Or husbands, you say that to your wives. Your daughter, right? It's not our daughter, it's your daughter. So he's not even owning him as his brother. He's saying, your son did this, right? And these are the, the same dynamics are going on here, uh, if you think about that in your family. And the father, again, now has to re reach out for reconciliation. And so the father steps out of his house. He goes out and pleads with him. The father is humbling himself to do that. Think about it. He has to humble himself to that point in order to reach the obedient son who doesn't share the same heart that he has. And so this son was supposed to be the one, probably if, if throughout this whole parable, who should have been a mediator between the other brother and his father. And he should have been speaking to his father and, and uh, his love this whole time. And he should be happy that there's a moment where reconciliation is possible, right? 
but he simply hasn't taken that role. He's going to be a little bit rebellious. And so the oldest son, uh, he's not taking a good role to represent the father. So no one who heard this parable probably could have understood how out of character the father is acting here. This is not the way it should be, and that's the point. That's the point. Jesus is saying that, that this is where the love of God is different than what we expect. The love of God is usually different in our lives than what we expect, isn't it? This is what God is like. God is love, right? God's love is so wide, it's so open, it's so gracious, there's no one beyond saving. And so he's willing to reach out to all of us. God's love doesn't have walls. God's love doesn't have conditions. God has a very sacrificial love. And he expressed it in Christ, and through Jesus he suffered, faced humiliation. Think about it. This father in, in the story faced humiliation. So our Heavenly Father faced humiliation by letting his son die for us in order to reach out to us. And so this story at this point is very unexpected. And this stuff that Jesus is talking about between the dynamics in this family is new for these people, but it expresses, it expresses the vision of Jesus' ministry. That's how Jesus ministered to people, right? And he explained the vision of, of the church of Jesus Christ. This was Jesus' message for the religious leaders. Although the older son stayed near the father geographically, he didn't run, he didn't take the money, he didn't leave, his heart was far from the father, wasn't it? It wasn't united with the father. It was probably further from the father than the son who left. His heart was closer to his father. And so this is true for Jesus' listeners that day. Jesus was surrounded by, surrounded by sinful people, and they were now coming close to God. They were, they were hearing about God, and God was celebrating. And then you had the religious leaders, the arrogant religious leaders, who appeared to be near God, but they're the ones who are furthest from him. And they're the ones who are probably the most displeasing to God. Their lack for others exposed their sinfulness, selfishness, and godlessness. So if we think about this story, it applies to all of us, doesn't it? All of us have at one point in our lives have been distant from God. Sometimes we're emotionally distant, sometimes we're spiritually distant, sometimes we're physically distant, right? Some of us have publicly turned our back on God, while others have privately turned their back on God. So there's people that just get up and say, you know what, I'm not going to church anymore, I'm not going to read my Bible, there is no God, I'm going to tell everybody in the world that. They're publicly turning their back on God. Then there's people who privately do that, but they still go through the motions. They still come to church, they still act religious, right? But they're, they've drawn away from God, and they're claiming to be near him. Either way, like the father in this story, he goes out to both types of people. He goes out to the one who ran away with open arms, ready to embrace, ready to kiss, ready to welcome back into the family, right? If they're willing to return. That same unconditional love is offered to those who humble themselves before God and receive it. Again, we read Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, he died for us. We all know John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So God the Father is loving. Don't forget that all good fathers are loving. Right? You may have a bad day, Dad. Kids, you may have a bad day. You may cross your father, and Father, you may cross your children, but you're loving. And we're to take the example of our Heavenly Father. And you know, God will allow tests and he will allow trials and he will allow very, various predicaments in our lives to bring us back to him. So those of us who've wandered away like the prodigal son, God will allow things in our lives to bring us back to him. And the result of those things challenges us and it causes our faith to grow, which is that then causes us to renew our relationship with God, not to mention destroying any hold on any particular sin in our lives. You know, I love, I love James chapter 1, verses 2 through 6, and I want to just read it and tear it apart for a minute. My brethren, call it all joy when you fall into various trials. That doesn't sound like fun. Or other versions say temptations. Or other versions say problems. Count it as joy when you have trials. 
knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So how do we get patience? Our faith is tested. It helps produce patience in our lives. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So if we don't let the patience work in our lives, right, we're not perfect, we're not complete, we're lacking. If any of you lacks wisdom, so if we don't understand what's going on in our lives, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So we're, we're being tried. It's strengthening our patience, right, to make us complete. God, I don't understand, so I'm going to ask you why this is happening. And then it says, but let him ask in faith. That means when I go to God and say, God, help me, I need to do it with a pure and a correct heart. No, not, with no doubting, it says. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. You know, Matthew 6, 25 and 33, we see our Father as a provider. Jesus says, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, for what you'll eat, for what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more, more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? How many found that worrying really helps? Like losing sleep and not eating and fretting, that just makes everything better, doesn't it? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider, I already, yeah, why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the valley, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, don't worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Here's the key right here. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. You know, it, we have struggles in life, we have trials in life, and a lot of times we go after that trial, we try to fix that trial, and we should be seeking after the kingdom of God and his righteousness and letting him solve the trial, right? We don't have to do that on our own. So we've been talking about our Heavenly Father, Abba Father, who is drawn near, the loving Father who grants mercy and grace, right? The Father who provides for our every need, and as we think about, I want you to think about those characteristics of God. He's loving, he provides grace, he provides mercy, he provides every need that we have. Think about how he approached the prodigal son. He loved him unconditionally even though he wronged him and ran away. He approached the, the elder son who kind of fits that religious arrogant leader, right? And he brought him back in. Think about the characteristics of that father because our Heavenly Father is like that. That's why Jesus told this story. And it's important that we understand that and we understand that God the Father, if we understand who God the Father is and the characteristics of Him, it will affect how you live, right? It will, it will affect how you live because you're not gonna worry about the things that you used to worry about or you're not gonna do the things that you used to do or you're not gonna worry that God is out to hit you with a lightning bolt every time you sneeze, right? There's people like that. Or you're not going to have to worry that the enemy is after you because no weapon formed against you will prosper, right? We know how to live if we know who and the characteristics of our Heavenly Father. You have to know Him. You have to learn about Him, right? And then it'll also change how you obey the Word of God. If you know who God is and His characteristics, you'll start to obey the Word of God differently. It'll even help you how to learn how to pray. Because if you know the characteristics of God, you'll know how to talk to God. So some of you I know very well, and I can walk up to you and we can have a conversation. We may not have talked in months, but I can talk to you like we talked yesterday because we know each other's character. And so I can go up to Ted and I can jab him in the ribs a little bit and tease him and know he's not going to smack me, right? That he'll laugh with me because I know Ted's character, right? And so if we know God's character and who God is, it's easier for us to have that prayer relationship, that conversation with God than if we don't know him. You know, Matthew 7, 11 is a good picture of our Heavenly Father who listens. It says, if then, being evil, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in Heaven give good things to those who ask Him? 
right? All of us want good for our children. And so fathers, you want good for your children, and that's natural. But how much more does a perfect father in heaven want good for us? And so think back to when you were a kid. I was thinking about this the other day as I was preparing this message. And, um, and I was thinking about what my father was like maybe when I was eight or nine years old. Now, my father was not a Christian. He wasn't the best father, but he provided every need that I needed. I, I never went hungry. I never went without a meal. He provided everything. But I remember, you know, if I really wanted something, okay? You're a kid. You're eight years old. Maybe it's a toy. Maybe it's candy or whatever. Maybe you want to go to a friend's house. There were three kinds of requests I could go to my father with. Three kinds of requests. Bear with me. One was the kind that you knew that there was just no use asking. You just knew it. You knew before you went to dad that if you said, dad, I want, the answer was going to be a flat out no. And if you asked why, because I said so, there was just no discussion, right? So that was one kind of request. It just wasn't worth asking because you knew the answer was going to be no. I knew the kind of man my father was. I knew... um, what he didn't want for my life. So a lot of times when I would go ask for something that was a flat out no, it was probably something that was not good for me, right? It was probably something that I wanted to do that was probably not good for me. Another was the request which I knew he would say yes to, right? So that's a second request because I knew what kind of a man my father was and I knew what he did want for my life. So I knew that if I would go ask him for something that, yep, that's a good thing, I would probably get a yes. Then there's a third request, <laughs> where, we're, where we're told to come up, we kind of come up with a strategy, because we're not quite sure, right, to get what you wanted. And so maybe you'd do something nice for dad, or, or maybe you, you, while he was putting you to bed, you, you would say something nice to him, or maybe you'd get mom involved and say, you know, mom, I think you need to come and talk to dad with me, right? B- because all that's possible because you know what kind of a man your father was. And so the same idea comes with prayer. So think about, think about those three scenarios. There's the yes, the no, and the well, okay, maybe. And, and, and we have to have a correct understanding of who our father is, right? Just like I knew who my earthly father was. So if I was eight years old and I, and I went to my earthly father and said, can I borrow the car and go to my friend's house, he's going to say no, right? Because I'm eight and that's just not good for me. And so when we ask God something in his name, in line with his character, he will answer. Did you get that? When we ask something of God in his name, our Heavenly Father, or in line with his character, he will answer. A lot of times we ask God things that are not in his character. God, I need a million bucks so I just don't have to work anymore. Probably not going to happen, right? But how well do we know our Heavenly Father? Jesus said in John 14, 9, you know, his followers longed to know the Father, and Jesus responded with these words, He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how do we know the character of our Heavenly Father? Start learning the character of Jesus. When you start learning the character of Jesus, you'll start learning the character of the Heavenly Father, right? He's not so distant anymore. He's not so far away anymore. Open up your Bible Look how Jesus lived. Look how Jesus helped and responded to people. Learn Jesus' character, and you'll know the Father, because they're one, right? Let's stand. So we see see God the Father in Jesus' life, don't we? Jesus forgives a prostitute with dignity and grace. That's how our Heavenly Father is. Jesus weeped with the family and friends of Lazarus. That's how our Heavenly Father is. Jesus calls, to ch- calls children to himself. That's how our Heavenly Father is. Jesus forgave his enemies. That's how our Heavenly Father is. And he promises to bless those who love him. That's how our Heavenly Father is. So Jesus was completing this picture for us. God's power and holiness that had, to be, that had been so clear in the years past... And now it's being coupled with intimacy. So remember, we kind of started and the, the Jews felt distant from God, but Jesus brought the intimacy in the, to that relationship and the intimacy with God the Father. And that was seen in the life and the death and the resurrection of Christ. It's a picture of God who pursues his people. 
God pursues you. You may not know that, but he pursues you. So when you start to drift, he's chasing you. He's chasing you. And, he, and he's passionate, and he's committed. He has committed love. Don't miss that balance, right? God is definitely the creator, right? He created all things, but he's also our father, Abba, Daddy, who desires that we draw near to him in reverence in the midst of our desperate needs. And so for those of you who are participating online or maybe in the room and you don't know the Father, you don't know him intimately, or you think you need to learn a little bit more about him, start by opening the Gospels and learning about Jesus. Start depending and understanding who Jesus is. Get to know Jesus, and then you'll, if you've seen him, as Scripture says, you will see the Father. So, so much of the Christian life depends on our understanding of our Heavenly Father, right? And, and our obedience in result of our love for our Heavenly Father. Our prayers depending on, depend on praying in agreement with the Father, right? Amen? So happy Father's Day, fathers. Let's love our Heavenly Father. Let's get to know our Heavenly Father. Let's get intimate with Him. Amen? Amen. So God, we love you. We thank you. I pray for each one who's here today. Men, women, children, Lord, I ask that you just help us to draw closer to you because you are our good Father. Lord, help us to build an intimate relationship with you. Yes, you are the creator of the universe. Yes, you've done big things, but you're not too big to love us individually. You're not too big to care about our concerns. You're not too big to wrap your arms around us, hug us, kiss us, put shoes on our feet, robes on us, and, and rings on our fingers. So God, we love you. We thank you that you sent Jesus to earth to die for us, but you also sent him to show us how intimate you are and how intimate he was. And so God, I thank you for the love that Jesus showed his people. Lord, in my life, as I approach people in this world who are struggling, who are hurting, I think in my mind and my heart, I need to love them just like Jesus did. It doesn't matter what they've done. It doesn't matter where they've come from. It doesn't matter the situation they're in. Lord, we need to love them like Jesus did. Then what we're doing is we're pointing them to you. It's not about what we're doing, God, but it's about loving them like Jesus and showing them who the Heavenly Father is. So God, I thank you that I can call you Father. I thank you that I can call you Abba, Father, Daddy. Lord, I thank you that you are spiritually covering all of us who believe in you. You're taking care of us. You're caring for every need that we have. You're chasing us down when we start to stray. So God, we love you. We thank you. We praise you, our good, good Father. In Jesus' name, amen.
thank you, Lord. You are our good, good Father. Abba, Father. We praise you, Lord God. Let's just say the Lord's Prayer to end the service. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Have a beautiful week. Happy Father's Day. God bless you all.